Welcome to the show. I am your host, Mike Vatter. This is Let's Catch Up with Mike. And today's guest is Mariel Fry. That was Talk, Talk, Talk by St. Michael featuring Anya Gold. And we have had a bit of a, <laughs> an adventure this morning. Um, my, right as we were about to start recording, my cable went out. Um, <laughs> the, the construction crew down the street did something and uh, the cable went out. We've had to reboot and just kind of reorganize. So I so appreciate your patience, Mariel. Thank you for joining us this morning. <laughs> Thank you. And of course, like you say, it's a Christmas miracle. So. Yes, a Christmas miracle that we got back on and we're on the air, which is just yay. All the all the uh, the uh, Hanukkah lights and Christmas angels came together and it's, you know, we're going to have uh, a prosperous episode. <laughs> so thank, thank goodness for all of that. Um, and I, as you saw at the beginning, I had your logo up instead of mine. And so people who are watching are going, wait, which episode is this? What show am I on? What podcast <laughs> is this? So I'm going to I'm going to bring your logo back up so we um, we can talk about your show because that's why we're here. This is Mariel Fry. Uh, you are the host of a podcast called Travel Experiences Reimagined. So I'm excited to talk about that. Um, Thank you. Tell me a little bit about yourself and your show and uh, and let's let's tell the audience about you. Sure. So my name is Marielle. I'm the founder of Travel Experiences Reimagined, where I'm looking to grow this as a business, but I'm focusing on the podcast to share the stories and elevate the voices of different tour guides and hosts every week in the tourism industry. And I love to travel. For me, travel is the best thing that's ever happened. I've been to over 10 plus countries, countless cities, and just the idea of getting on a plane and going somewhere new really excites me. So the idea of combining when you travel, right, the idea of doing different experiences, but also being able to share the stories through a podcast and bringing this together has been just beyond my wildest dreams. I'm so passionate. I'm so excited. And I'm really excited to talk about it. That's awesome. I love uh, one of the things that I love more than anything else is traveling. But um, obviously, over the last, you know, almost two years now with this pandemic, I've been um, not not terrified of traveling, but but terrified of the people <laughs> that I've been, you know, forced to travel with on airplanes and, and whatnot. Um, how has the travel industry, obviously, we know how it's been affected, but how has it been, how has it affected your, um, your specific, you know, view in your specific industry? And how is it, you know, how are you seeing it affected? So with tour guides, it's definitely hard. A lot of them have closed their businesses. They've pivoted to doing something different. So I've interviewed probably over 30 tour guides. Right now I have five episodes up today in this moment, but as each episode goes on, you'll hear each and every story. And a lot of them do bring up the pandemic and it's been really hard, right? With especially 2020 people not traveling, that's, it's just devastating beyond words. But what I've realized is when you think of business travel and corporate travel, I've worked in kind of both. And business travel will forever change. A lot more people will do Zoom. A lot more people will cut back on their spend. I know in previous jobs I've had, they're looking to cut 50% of their travel spend, which is a big deal. But what we've seen is leisure travel has been tried and true again, that people are going to travel. You see the digital nomads coming out of this as remote workers and living elsewhere. So that's boosting tourism. That's boosting people going to that particular city or country. So we can look at this a lot of different ways. I think when you think about the seasons of COVID, right, typically winter is going to be worse there. You know, now this Omricon variant is out. 
So to travel is going to be much more expensive with the testing. The rules are going to change and it's going to be a lot more complicated. But if we think about travel in summer, spring, you know, kind of warmer months, yeah. it's going to be better, right? Not as many people get sick. You don't have so many rules and it will constantly be this kind of change, I think, for the next couple of years. So it's really thinking about your planning, where you're going, kind of the who, what, when, where, and why when you have the thoughtfulness of travel. And I don't want people to be afraid, right? I don't want people to be scared. I think it's in our mind, I do think certain rules will change. So certain countries will be harder to go to, but think of it as trying to figure out what is the best place for you that you feel comfortable. Because what I will say to you, you're actually pretty safe on an airplane. Why? because you are getting tested before and after. Right. So you know every single person on that plane in theory, right? I say this somewhat loosely, but pretty true. You're negative. Now, if I were to go on a train, right? I live outside of New York City. If I were to just get on a train, nobody's checking my vaccine card. No, right. I'm not required to take a negative test every single day. So when I'm on there, not everybody's even wearing their mask. Sure, they mandate and do a fine, but you can, like, I can just walk on a plane. I mean, I'm sorry, I walk on a train and not have an issue. So again, it really depends on your situation, how comfortable you feel, how long you want to be away for. There's a lot of variables, what time of year, where you're going, right? If you go to Mexico, it's warm all year. So you can go in January, February, and it's not as bad. But if you were to go to Iceland, it's a bit colder, right? So I, I think it's really thinking about travel and being really thoughtful in that process and understanding the news and what's going on, but being realistic for yourself as well. And also maybe where you're going as far as um, what the numbers look like, you know, is there a spike where you're going? Are they accepting outside travelers? Um, you know, what, what, do the, um, what, what do the pandemic numbers in general look like? Not just, um, you know, cases as far as, uh, you know, COVID, but, you know, just illnesses in general. That's something we've always had to look at. You know, do they require vaccinations for other things where you're going? Um, that's something that's been around for decades. Um, you know, some places where, you know, if you're going to um, Barbados versus, you know, I don't know, the Middle East or, or you're going to a subtropical area versus, and like you said, Iceland, some places require you to be vaccinated for certain things, you know, when you, you know, before you go and when you come back pre-COVID. Um, so uh, that's you know, a lot of Africa, I would say yeah. for sure. And Africa, you know, I have a girlfriend of mine going to Botswana and she has to go through a lot of different, you know, vaccines and that's yeah. not including COVID. So it depends again, where you go. Most places you typically don't need an extra vaccine, right. but for particular countries, yes, you want to protect yourself and you want to be careful. So yeah. it, it, it's just really checking the rules and keeping yourself updated. I mean, perfect example of this. My husband and I just went to England and when we were there, the rules kept changing. So we kept having to change our test, which is very stressful. And now the rules oh have gosh, changed yeah. again. I'm so, sure that would have been <laughs> in the middle of your vacation. You find <laughs> out you've got to change whatever you've done oh, is now not the norm. Yeah. And, you know, the thing is, and I don't want to be quoted on this, quote unquote, but supposedly in America, they can only change the rules once every 30 days. Mm. So once the, there's rules in place, you cannot and you should not change those rules. Now, I can't speak for other countries. In the UK, they change their rules every week, right? right? In Germany, that could be the same case. So again, it's really being thoughtful and careful and looking at the numbers, looking at what these countries are doing. And the best rule of thumb, in my opinion, sure, the news is good, but look at government websites. Look right. at the us.gov website. Look at germany.gov. Look at these government websites because that's typically the most up-to-date information. And that's the most accurate information you're going to find where you can look at it as say I'm a US citizen, right? right? I'm looking to go to the UK. I would look up the US government information on their website. If I'm going to the UK, what do I need? But vice versa of that, if I'm going to the UK, I want to know UK's website. Okay. If I'm a US citizen as a foreign traveler, what do I need to know, right? Does that mirror, does that match? Do I need something different? Again, it's really being so thoughtful and reading through everything when it comes to travel, especially nowadays. Yeah, and the difference is in the United States where we have 50 states making 50 different travel rules. If you go into the UK, they have universal healthcare, they have universal rules. You're gonna have the same rules, you know, same laws throughout the UK or throughout Germany or throughout Poland, wherever you go, it's gonna be one rule 
you know, and they can change it up, you know, like you said, every week, it, as opposed to having, you know, uh, Congress and three, three branches of government <laughs> fighting about it every, you know, every 30 days or whatever it is. So yes. that's, you know, that's good that you, you know, you, you make that suggestion. So that's very cool. Um, you know, so, and you mentioned trains versus planes, and now I'm thinking of planes, trains, and automobiles, one of the best, <laughs> one of the best travel movies ever made. Um, but, uh, you know, if you're, if you're renting a car or something, when you get over there, they may have different rules as well, as far as showing your vaccination card. If you're traveling, once you, once you've taken the plane to wherever you're going, you know, they may have different vaccination uh, requirements as far as the ID goes, as far as anything like that. Um so, it, you know, um, as far as the as COVID rules and vaccine rules go, just the best thing to do is due diligence. Make sure you know where you're going, what the rules are, you know, for at least the beginning of your trip. And then make sure yes. you check, make sure you check the rules as you're, <laughs> as you're you know, on your stay, um, obviously. So that's great advice. What is the um, I mean, I'm going to kind of get off the COVID topic for a few minutes and, and ask sure. um, what is the. Um, what is the most unusual place that you visited? Uh, I'm gonna, I'm focused on you for a little bit. What's the most sure. unusual place that you visited, um, not just during COVID, but ever? So I'm definitely going to say parts of Southeast Asia where okay. I did a motorcycle tour for about five days with my dad and I'm going to shout out Uncle Nine. He is fantastic. He's out of Da Nang and he does really private motorcycle tours where he takes you kind of north, south, east, west, kind of wherever you want to go. And so we did this motorcycle tour. And as you're driving up, we stopped through one of these cities. Now, mind you, they've never seen an American. They, they don't, like, we don't understand their language. They don't know English at all. And we walked through it and people, I honestly thought these people thought I was an alien. It was the craziest <laughs> thing. They didn't understand. People like wouldn't even walk near us. They were really nervous to talk to us just because we looked different and we didn't speak their language. They were such a community that I don't even think they had TV. Maybe oh, wow. they had a like a, a flip phone. They really didn't have anything. So when I tell you, these people had like the chickens with the egg and they had, you know, their own community of buying and selling different foods. Oh, like a barter like, system. A little bit. Yeah. They really had no idea wow. about us. They were really just they like almost had deer in headlights. It was very bizarre. Like girls would kind of laugh and like look at me and then walk the other way. It was a very surreal experience, but it it makes you think about life. Like not everybody has TV, not everybody has technology and that certain people just, I don't know, they're just, they're in their own world, right? They don't really know what's going on. So the fact that they see a foreigner, it's, they don't even know what that word means, right? right. <laughs> like they, they just don't understand why this person is here and how we ended up there. It was the most surreal, cool, but weird experience at the same time. So, so that was you, definitely very unusual. <laughs> you went to a part of the world that has never heard of a Kardashian? Yes. <laughs> what? I want to live there. <laughs> just for that reason. <laughs> yes. They probably have no idea. They really are like in their own world. So. That's awesome. I love that. Super cool. I, I think I saw a picture of you on that motorcycle in uh, on your Facebook page. That's that's very cool. You looked like a Sherpa because you had like all these backpacks <laughs> and you had all these bags. Well, that's how like, people live. By I, was, the way. I was looking. I was like, how is she holding that motorcycle up? And I realized you had the kickstand down. Oh, yeah. Had, no, I was you not were doing totally that. loaded up with all these bags. <laughs> And, you know, it was, it was a cool picture. Yeah, so, um, I did not do that. I have to ask what what um, what is the worst uh, trip you've ever taken? You don't have to like name people you were with or anything, and you don't have to like disparage the country or whatever. But like, not like worst experience uh, traveling. Oof. I've had so many good ones. It's so hard to say. I'm gonna say I did a trip to Berlin, Amsterdam, and London with my sister, where okay. I had a friend of mine in Frankfurt at the time. The trip was great, but we all ended up kind of sick. Oh, and it was horrible. That'll because, ruin any trip. You could be on your oh, best vacation ever. If you get sick while traveling, that's the worst. Yes, that was terrible because when you're sick, trying to walk around and see the sights, you're just thinking, I want to be in bed. I don't want to be out and about. Yeah. I mean, another time I had, again, I went to Southeast Asia with my dad three times. And one of the times I went, I actually got food poisoning. Ooh. And <laughs> true story. I can't believe I'm sharing this like on public, <laughs> but well, here we go. We let the cat out of the bag. Yeah, there you go. I did a Mekong Delta tour where you go along the Mekong Delta and you do this lunch almost in like a forest, right? It was super cool. And you know, you're there with all the food on the table, like a local cooked all this food. And I'm kind of adventurous. I've tried alligator, I've tried crickets, I've tried weird things, but I tried the fish, right? I eat fish. 
didn't well, seem fine. I ended up later that night, like I couldn't really eat. My dad's like, what's wrong with you? I said, I don't know. Like I couldn't eat like pizza and salad. Like I, and that's like normal food to me. Right. I that. Yeah. That's New Yorker food. <laughs> New Yorker food in Vietnam. Yeah. Like it was fine. Right. <laughs> so we walked toward this opera house. We were supposed to go see a beautiful show that night. And as I'm walking, I ended up throwing up on the street. Oh no. I felt so sick. And my dad is like, my dad, I love my dad, but he's not very like TLC, tender loving right. care, like yeah. in terms of like taking care of someone. So he just started laughing. He's like, are you okay? I was like, yeah, I'm just threw up on the side of the street, but sure, I'm okay. Right. So then he ends up just getting me gum. <laughs> like, no there, water. There are parts nothing. of Asia where it's illegal to spit in the street, and you're there throwing up in the street. Yes, in Vietnam, <laughs> I know. It was so embarrassing. So then my dad gets me gum, and he's like, can you sit through this opera show? And I said, right. yeah, I mean, I unfortunately slept through most of it. Oh. And then the next day I had food poisoning where I just laid around, which was horrible, yeah. but I ended up getting better from it and I was fine, but that was like a blip in the schedule and not supposed to happen, of course. Right. Um, and funny enough, we ran into other people who did the tour and they also got sick too. So it wasn't just me, Okay. but it that was like terrible. So now when I go away to like certain countries, I just, I'm like, yeah, I'm a vegetarian because <laughs> I don't want to eat the crazy things. I'd rather eat more the vegetables and the right. rice and all that because you can get sick and it's kind of being careful. So I would definitely suggest <laughs> leaning more toward the vegetables and rice and noodles and all that. Right. That's, that's, um, I'm sorry that happened to you, but it's actually kind of a funny story. So. Oh, it's a great story now. <laughs> yeah. and, and when it happened, I thought this is horrible, yeah. but in hindsight, yeah, it's hilarious. I love though that you're adventurous with your, with your diet when you're traveling though, because I know people who will go to foreign countries and they are, very American. And I, I say that, you know, in the negative yes. way, uh, <laughs> yes. where they, you know, they're like, well, I won't eat that because uh, it's not the way I expected pasta in Italy to be because no. I'm, used to, I'm used to Olive Garden <laughs> or I won't, you know, no, I mean, and no, they, no, no. A lot I of hate countries, that. <laughs> I do too. And a lot of countries will not um, substitute or they won't, um, you know, if you say I no. want that on the side or I want it prepared a certain way, it's on the menu the way that they're going to serve it. And you don't ask for substitutions. You don't get it the way you want it. You get and it the way the, the chef thing. makes it. Yeah. And here's the thing. So I've interviewed a bunch of food tour yeah. guides and they do incredible food experiences. And what I say to anybody who is a paleo, keto, gluten-free, you know, celiac, vegetarian, vegan, definitely ask the tour guide because yeah. chances are they can accommodate. Right. But going to a restaurant's a little bit different. They may not be able to. But right, like if you're going to Italy, right? I didn't even think about a bottled wine. I got the house wine, right? right? For three euros, I got a big glass of wine that was incredible and had the pasta and went to a local place for a sandwich or a pizza or whatever. But then when you go to Southeast Asia, the best pad thai I ever had was street food pad thai right. on the side of the road. They're making it there in front of you in like the leaf it was so, and it was under $2. So right. the argument is be adventurous, be careful, right? If you are allergic to things, I definitely think you need to protect yourself in that way, especially yeah. if you're gluten-free or, you know, you're not eating meat, whatever it is. But at the same time, like you, you go to a certain place for experiences. And that's where my podcast comes in. Because when you travel to Italy, I want to eat the pasta, I want to eat the pizza. I want to drink the wine. I want to have the chocolate. I want to shop in Gucci. Like I want that experience, which yeah. I did an incredible food tour in Florence, which was amazing and took you to hole in the wall places that I wouldn't know on my own. And even in Southeast Asia, like I did the street food, you know, and we ended up being friends with someone who owned her own restaurant. It's called Apron Up. It's excellent. And I did her uh, cooking name. class. Yeah, yeah, excellent name. And I did her cooking class and ended up eating at her restaurant. And it's people like local people, you know, making this. Right. So I encourage anybody, depending where you go, like look at the special foods. It's something I like to ask in my episodes too. You know, obviously if you're in London, eat the fish and chips, right? right. If you're yeah. in Spain, have the paella. If you're right. in Portugal, I did an incredible food tour um, in Lisbon. It's called uh, Taste of Lisboa. Ooh. And the girl, I don't know if she's still there, so I won't say her name, but she was amazing. And you see the pastel denies. I don't know if you know, if anyone doesn't know what those are, it's like a custard 
kind of okay. um, little thing. I don't know how to explain it, but it's heaven. It's like crack. I don't know how to like explain this any other way, but it's so good. Okay. And they they told, you know, they got it from a local place that a granny makes them. Aww. So I encourage anybody to do a food tour if you don't know the area, if you don't know what to do, especially beginning, right? Beginning of your trip, always do tours. That's something I like to really hone in on because when you do tours in the beginning, you can ask the local people, hey, where do you recommend I check out next? What neighborhoods, what yeah. food places? And you're able to actually go there, right? And you have time toward the end of your trip to walk yeah. around and explore. So there's so much, you know, I, I just encourage really like support local people. They, you know, and that's part of my, you know, my podcast is I want to support these local people who are creating amazing experiences for you to try, for you to do, to get that like spark to travel because right. COVID is here. I'm very aware, but COVID will not be here quote unquote forever. And people aren't going to live in this fear forever. People are going to travel. And it's why I really think leisure travel will be the dominant force moving forward. People will want to travel. People will want to get out there. And the thing I encourage is like support local people because that in tune helps funnel everything else. When like, when you support a local person, right? You're supporting their, their life, their house, their kids, their yeah. family, you're able, they're able to pay into these different businesses as well. So when you travel, you know, I'm working on a blog post on this, but it, it funnels so much more. It's why us is the number one, I think moneymaker is tourism. I think they make close to 300, is it 300 billion, some crazy number. Right. I, and yeah. don't quote me on this either, but they it's make so there. much money from like tourism. Like tourism is a massive money maker for these countries. And even like I went to Cancun in September, right? They were careful about the testing. They were careful, very, very careful about masks. Even at malls, they did your temperature check and made you do hand sanitizer as when you walked right. in. And yeah. even every single store you walked into. So because they know tourism is so important. They know that. Yeah. So it's, again, it's, it's being careful, mindful, but support local people. They, they, this is how they live. Tourism right. is one of the biggest sectors in hospitality of jobs. I think in the world, if I can argue that when yeah. you think of restaurants, you think of bars, you think of hotels, you think of concierge, you think of salespeople, you think of chefs, you think of, you know, bus boys, you think of waiters, you think cab of drivers. bartenders, cab drivers, right. Yeah. Transportation airplanes, you know, pilots, like again, and flight attendants, I can go on and on and on, yeah. but there, <laughs> I guess there's so much to tourism that I hope people can kind of understand and wrap their head around even just a little bit. Right. Yeah. And I agree with all of that. So I'm, I'm really glad that you brought those up. I think also, um, you know, people need to remember not just, you know, when you go to a, uh, to another country, it's not, it's not uh, meant to no. In, let me th let me think of how I want to phrase this. Um, it's not an extension of your of your lived experience. You're going to be a part of. You're going to immerse yourself in the culture of where you're going, or don't go. You know, and, and regardless of your dietary restrictions, I mean, obviously consider those things. Um, you know, but uh, there's a there's an old song. I think it's from uh, the show Broadway Baby. It's a a, a stage musical where um, the line is, why do the worst people travel and the best people stay at home? Because <laughs> I, I know a couple that on their honeymoon, they went to, I think it was Florence, um, and they were so picky. It, it was They ordered the pasta, I don't know the name of the dish, but they ordered the pasta dish that uses um, squid ink as the pasta sauce. Oh, so good. <laughs> yeah, and I know everyone I know who's ordered that, who knows what they're getting, raves about it. But they mm -hmm. ordered it thinking, oh, we're going to eat like the locals. And it was a small portion. And Ooh. they, you know, they didn't know how, first of all, they complained that the portion was too small. Then oh. they complained of the way it was prepared and presented on the table where they actually put the ink on at the table. They were disgusted by the way it looked. They didn't like the way oh, it tasted. They sent no. it back, which never send food back, you know, Ooh, first of all, no. in a foreign country. Oh, yeah. no. So they, <laughs> they did everything wrong. Um, they were also there during uh, during the Trump presidency, who was, you know, whether not to get into politics, you know, between sure. you and I or anything. But um, I because I always try to avoid politics unless that's the topic of my show. But, um, you know, they they were in a country that didn't like Trump, 
and they were obviously Americans and they were acting very American. Um, yeah. I always try to, I tell people, if you, if you are in a country that doesn't like Americans, tell people you're Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> That's because, the best advice. <laughs> because everyone loves Canadians and no one really take, has, a, has a problem with Canadians and they never want to talk about Canadian politics because nobody knows Canadian politics in other countries. That is so smart. <laughs> and know? I love that. And I, I want to circle back to something you said yeah. too about being cheap. Yes. Because that drives me nuts. Yeah. I feel you can, you know, I'm also coming out with a blog post about this on where to save and spend. Right. Because a lot of times... You can save in certain ways, right? Especially, I don't know the mileage and reward world that well, but my husband has a, like a Delta card, we get points and it helps us save on flights. So there is a way to save there, right? For me Absolutely. personally, I, I used to travel Sometimes with thousands of dollars. Oh yes, a hundred percent. And I've traveled. So I did two trips with a girlfriend of mine. Our first trip actually was a whole Italy trip. And the second trip we did Madrid and Lisbon. And what we did was we got Airbnbs, which I personally love. Um, I stay in hotels because of my husband, but I love an Airbnb. I love to be like local, super cool. It's just, it's a great experience. To walk out the front door and be in a neighborhood of the place you're visiting is so cool. That's what I love. And for me, going with my girlfriend, we ended up splitting the Airbnb. So an Airbnb that's $100, we split that. So it's 50-50, right? Right. So you can split that and then stay somewhere a little bit nicer. So again, you're saving money, but you're not losing out on the experience. And again, coming back to tours, of course, you you go there to experience something, right? Like, why would I spend three days in a new country and just gallivant? Like I did that before and I've learned from that and I never want to do that again, ever, ever, ever. Because you waste so much valuable time and you're not really like honing in on the place. Like to do a tour, you can learn a lot in a short amount of time and have the ability again to talk to your tour guide and get to know them and I ask for recommendations. So you're not lollygagging. You know, another great tour I did which I recommend anybody to do. I've done a Vespa tour. If you're not afraid of like being on a Vespa. That sounds like so much fun. It's the best. I did one in Rome, which was wonderful. And it's Rome by Vespa. The guy, I forgot his name now, but he's wonderful. And my girlfriend and I did it. And I I forgot how much it cost, but I'll have to send you a link on it. Okay. But it was like a four hour tour, but he kind of took us wherever we wanted. Like he had a whole gist of like where to go and what to do. But what he did was he also had a GoPro and he took a video. So at the end, we got like our own video, which is that's awesome. I love that idea. Yeah, super smart. And like really got to take us everywhere in Rome, which, by the way, if you've ever been to Rome, it's a crazy city. It's so much traffic, so many people. It's just it's wild. But I've also done Vespa tours in Southeast Asia where I've done them in Vietnam, which is a great place because everybody rides in Vespa. Like I've seen like a family of four on a Vespa. It's nuts. Oh my I've God. seen like, hu- <laughs> yeah, I've seen like huge things like on a Vespa, like people carrying like pottery or ceramics or whatever, like on the back of that motorcycle was our lo- like suitcases and luggage. Yeah, I saw. I saw so it's crazy. Like what they can fit on there. Like even right. I have a photo of that I saw years ago. I think it was in Thailand of like a dog on the back of a Vespa, like sitting there. <laughs> So Vespas, I think, are one of the best ways to see yeah. a city, in my opinion. If you're if you have the ability and the city, of course, has Vespas, right. love a Vespa tour. I think yeah. they're also a really fun way to get around the city and see things in a quicker time. Yeah. That you're not in a car feeling stuck, but you're not right. walking where it would take you forever to like walk all that. And they're much easier to navigate than a motorcycle. They're easier to drive, they're faster to learn. Yeah. Yeah. I'm always passenger, but yes, if you wanted to drive your own, (laughs) you can do that. I like to be passenger because for me, I like the idea of like looking around. Um, I I like the idea of like doing that. Even I did a jet ski tour actually this past summer out of Rockaway. So it goes pretty much all through Rockaway, Brighton Beach, Coney Island, and it kind of goes a little bit up toward the Brooklyn Bridge. Oh, cool. And then it takes you back around to set, excuse me, Ellis Island and Statue of Liberty. And then you go back. And then I love the tour. It ended up being a private tour, funny enough. I booked a public tour, but it was just my girlfriend and I who did it. And the guy took a bunch of pictures of us. So it was like our own little private experience. Nice. But like you think of those memories, right? And I'm not saying right. some of these experiences are cheap, right. but the, the biggest thing I can say to somebody, and this is something I'm looking to do in my business, is to help people book tours that are right for them. Now, what do right. I mean by that? 
we're smart these days to book air, to book hotel, to book car services, transportation. But a lot of times people just book a tour to book a tour. You're not actually like, there's no thought behind it. You just kind of book it because maybe you should do it. Maybe it's the, you, the right thing to do, but do you want to do it? Are you happy doing it? And so I break it down in terms of clarity in regards to, you know, are you a morning person? Are you a night person? What actually interests you, right? Like, like maybe it's not the touristy things. Like if you go to Paris, maybe your dream is the Eiffel Tower, but what if it's not? Right. What if you don't want to do Eiffel, like to see the Eiffel Tower? That's okay. Like do a tour that aligns with your values, what you want to do and what you want to learn. Like, look, I'm not a history person. I think history is great. I do history tours. I like the idea of seeing it, but I'm a foodie. Like if you right. haven't noticed. I love food. So for me to do a food tour, I like it because it is that history and culture, but I get to learn about a city in a really unique way by trying their local food. I mean, I've tried some of the greatest, coolest, most interesting things, some great, some maybe not so great, but it's been such a wonderful experience. Like the one in Florence that I did, I literally went into it thinking, I don't know what I'm getting myself into. And I left drunk with new friends. Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> like it was just such a wonderful experience where the guy yeah. even, we were supposed to see um, the Uffizi or the uh, Michael, maybe the Michelangelo. I don't remember, okay. but like he walked us to the place after he's like, Oh, I'll walk you there. No problem. Like wow. really wonderful person. His name's Matteo. He does the Airbnb experience, but he's wonderful. And so again, I encourage people to really think about a local experience, support these people, but also as a tourist, right? You don't want to spend your money on just wasting it away. It's aligning a tour with a person, you know, and that's part of the reason I like the podcast is when you listen to somebody's voice, you feel like you get to know them a little bit. Mm -hmm. It's not like you read the reviews, you know, maybe not as many people are fortunate to do a video, right? It's trying to find a way to get to know somebody and connect with their energy. And if I'm able to do that through my podcast, I mean, already people have reached out. I really like that guy from Ireland. I want to do his tour. Or yeah. I like that girl from Paris. I want to do her tour. Because when you're able to listen to a voice and connect to them in some way, you're more inclined to like look into them, research them and get an idea. So it's, it's kind of mirroring all these things. But I just, I totally believe in doing it that way. Absolutely. And I love that you're saying, you know, don't do the thing that everyone does just because it's the thing to do. I, I, I can't tell you the number of people I know who've gone to see the Mona Lisa and then complain <laughs> about how small it is. Yes. And I'm like, you don't have to go, I mean, buy a postcard of the Mona Lisa or take a picture of the museum, you know, from the outside. If you want to say you were there or prove you were at the building, then do that. You don't have to wait in line for six hours to go see the thing everyone there was there to see just so you can complain about how long the line was you know 100 percent. i've got i've got family that went to go uh, went to ireland and they said we waited in the rain for an hour to kiss the blarney stone and i'm like why after 10 yeah. minutes i would have bailed you know <laughs> i mean <laughs> why why did you do that you there, i can think of a, a bunch of other things i'd rather do it for an hour than stand in the rain <laughs> you know Oh, a hundred percent. And nowadays with a lot of museums, what they're doing, I know when I went to Amsterdam, they're doing it. So you have to book like two months out and it's by appointment. So you're right. getting in the door, right? So I think it's being strategic on how you want to plan a trip. Again, it, it really depends where you want to go. It's yeah. understanding the surroundings. It's understanding what your interests are, what you want to do, what are the rules around it? And just making sure, right? If you want to eat, guess what? You can email people. Yeah. I know that's like a a tab, I don't want to say taboo, right? We email for work, but yeah. if a lot of times if people don't want to call internationally, you can always email. You can right. always email somebody and ask a question, right? Chances are if they have an email and it's valid and it's working, you can right. email them, right? I think the more interesting thing is when I go to Southeast Asia, when you do a booking tours, they actually prefer WhatsApp to book through yes. because they don't really have websites. Their Wi-Fi is not good. So again, it's really taking the map of the world and understanding different territories, cities, countries, et cetera, but understanding how they operate, right? Some companies, like most Europe doesn't like Amex, period. They don't like all the fees that go are surrounding it. So it's being mindful that like Visa, MasterCard is more acceptable worldwide. Yeah. And understanding it's Everywhere that. you want to be. <laughs> yeah, yeah, everywhere you want to be. Yeah. So <laughs> it's just kind of being, again, it, there's a lot of different approaches and ways you could talk about travel, which is why there's so many experts in this field um, to talk about the different you know, assets of it. But 
it's just, again, being, I think my biggest thing that I come and take away from it is like being really thoughtful in the approach, being really thoughtful in where you're going, what you want to do, who you're traveling with, what's your budget. It's like coming up with these questions, right? And, and you don't need to spend millions of dollars on a trip. Listen, if I had millions of dollars, sure, maybe I'd be a little bougie. But at the end of the day, a little bit, right? Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. But for me, I feel you can make a trip affordable depending on where you're going, who you're with. Like people always used to ask me like, oh, when's the best time to go to DR? Or where's the best place to travel in April? Like, I don't know. What do you like? What are you into? What are you interested in? Like, that's not a question for me. I can be a coach and guide you, right? That's what I'm looking to do is guide you through that journey. But at the end of the day, you're going to make the decision. You're the one that's going to say, I'm going to travel to this place and I want to do this tour because of blah, blah, blah. So it's, it's me guiding you in the direction of an incredible trip, but you're going to take that incredible trip. You're going to have those experiences. You're going to make those memories to last a lifetime. So it's being, again, it's being realistic on what you want because you can have a million people tell you a million things, but it's you as a tourist making those decisions. What's the one place that you've never been that you are excited to go? really want to go to Taiwan, like dying. I know this is so weird. (laughs) You probably weren't expecting that. No, I was expecting, I was expecting someplace because you've mentioned Asia so many other times. I thought, well, she's probably been to everywhere in Asia. So (laughs) no, I've I've been to Thailand, Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia, and I've done Sri Lanka. Um, but I, and look plenty of places in Europe, like in Europe. So let's take it by country. Okay. If I were to go to Europe, I definitely want to go to Greece. It's okay. one of those dreamy places that look beautiful. It does. But again, I would travel pretty much anywhere. So I'm not super picky. Asia, I'm like dying to go to Taiwan. I've been like wanting to go for years. I'm going to go because I just, I don't know what it is, but I'm so fascinated with like their culture. And for me, I loved, if you're short like me, I'm 4'11". Going to Southeast Asia is a gold mine because you are the average height. And the shopping there is amazing. <laughs> I, I go with an empty suitcase. I would be a giant in most Asian countries. I, I'm almost six one. So oh I'm wow, just, I'm, I'm just over six feet. I'm not quite six one. So my right husband's bit, yeah. six three. So oh yeah. my gosh. Oh yeah, he's, yeah. He's, he's a giant. Yeah, Even my dad's like there. five ten, and he felt really large. You know, going to yeah. Southeast Asia, but as four eleven, shop till you drop, and it's cheap. <laughs> And everything fits because you are the average size. So yep. it's amazing. But definitely Taiwan. I have like this weird fascination. Granted, I'd love to do Japan too, but I, I there's something about Taiwan I really need to see. Very cool. um, in terms of Africa, I, I probably would do South Africa, but I would love to go to like Tanzania or Botswana and check out the safaris. I've heard they're like amazing. So I'd love yeah. to do that. And then if I'm thinking South America, I really would love to do Buenos Aires. I know that's a bit overrated, but I've heard incredible things about it. But I also would do Machu Picchu. So I don't know. I love to travel. It's very hard for me to like pick one place, but there's so many amazing places. But the first one on your list is Taiwan. Yeah, Yeah. I definitely want to go there in like some capacity. A a friend of mine, uh, she and her husband did a um, a photo safari in... um, Zimbabwe and they oh, had wow. so much fun they loved it so that's I would love to, any any place in on, on the continent of Africa I would love to do a um a photo safari so that would be like my that would be my dream trip so yeah I'm not amazing. I'm not picky about where I just you know because I'm I'm a I, you know I'm a shutterbug so I would love to just you know and I love animals so that's you know, like you know the key um yeah. Anywhere I can go and take pictures of animals in their natural habitat would be fun for me. Oh yeah. I'm but dying they, to do that yeah. too. Yeah. And I think Australia, but I think most of the animals there don't want you there. <laughs> That's what I've heard too. Oh, no. And I don't know. I don't have like the desire. Like to me, I feel Australia feels very American. So yeah. from like what I've heard, again, I'm no expert in Australia, but I don't have like the biggest desire. Like if I had the opportunity to go, listen, I would jump two yeah. seconds, Yeah. but I'm not like itching to go like there's a lot of other places they'd rather itch that scratch to go yeah. versus like just to go so I, w- I, I would go live in sydney if we, i mean you know sight unseen i'd go live in sydney tomorrow because i feel like it's just you know like new york or chicago you know Same. I feel like, but but i would yeah if someone said you know go live in sydney for a year you know here's a job i would do it uh no problem no questions asked but if someone said you know photo safari in the outback I would be scared because I, I mean, from what everyone tells me, the animals there will kill you 
for no reason. Like they just don't want people there. <laughs> yeah. And I can understand that too. And I think there's so many like conservatories now trying to yeah. conserve these places and they're yes. doing an incredible job. So yeah. I mean, yeah, I wouldn't live there in Africa. Right. I would go to visit. I would right. have a wonderful time, but right, I wouldn't exactly. particularly live there. Not my se. first choice. So yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. But somewhere like Sydney, I think would be great. I would think that would be a, a fun place to live. But like I said, to visit, and eh, I don't know. Yeah. 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 I can agree anyway. with that. Um, so what do you, what is your um, advice to people who have never traveled outside the U.S. at all, ever? Um, and they're wanting to book through an agent for the, like they, they say, you know, I've never done this. I've never booked through an agent. I have no idea how to even get started. Like what's first step. Get your passport. Ah, that's very important. That, that's a very important key. I was thinking they probably already done that. So what? No, next... people don't even think to do they that. They don't think to do that. No, really? no. That's, people don't. that's I the know most people... basic thing. Yes. But if here's how, okay. Here's how I rationalize things. Okay. You have to talk to people, not dumb because I don't like to say that word right. but you have to talk to them like dummy down style right like the dummy <laughs> books you have to talk to people like they're five traveling for dummies <laughs> a little bit a little bit I mean look if you're going international passport a hundred percent right I know people who have gotten part of my French but screwed because they get to the airport their you know their passport's about to expire and they cannot right. get on the plane so oh, make wow. sure your passport is up to date up to snuff and make sure it's valid for at least six months, but I argue even a year. Yeah, so if your passport's going to expire within a year, think about renewing it wow. because you don't want to be in that situation. And especially with passport delays, which you can do rush my passport, which is what I've done recently. Right. Excellent service. So highly recommend. Yeah. Um, but if you have the time, definitely get it like a year, like start the process a year before, because yeah. no joke, people don't even think about that. Then you think about visas. Right? right. Depending where you have to go, every country has a visa. So yep. when you go to Vietnam, it's about $140, I think. Okay. You know, and you can rush expedite that. So that costs a little bit more um, if you go to embassy and get it done. But typically that's about the price and it lasts up to 30 days or 60 days. Don't quote me on it. Okay. But then if you go to Laos, you just land at the airport. They have like a little, um, kind of like display of all the prices and countries so for america i think it's 35 or 40 dollars but you just pay for it on arrival and get the visa like a visa vending machine <laughs> a little bit except yeah. there's actually a person doing it okay. but yes same idea <laughs> um but yeah so it, it's being thoughtful of the visa process because that process could sometimes take you months as well depending on the country make sure that the rules are are you know acceptable because again depending on the passport you have is going to be dependent on the rules and the visas so it's really being mindful of that because if you, like, for example, Brazil, Okay. if you go to Brazil as an American, you need a visa. However, I believe it's a UK passport. You don't need a visa. Okay. So it's really just understanding your rules in your countries and understanding the visa process. So right there, those are like two huge things. Then we can break it down into, are you comfortable on a plane, right? Some people who, if you've been on a plane domestically, you might be okay but can you deal with a nonstop long flight? It depends where you go, but if you want to do a connecting flight to kind of get up, stretch your legs, to do connecting is great. If you want a nonstop, depending on where you're going, you can spend, I've done 16 hours on a flight. Oof. It's not yeah. fun, but yeah. you can do it. <laughs> depends on like, again, it depends on how comfortable you feel being on a plane. Now with masks, are you comfortable being on a mask, you know, on a plane for 12 hours and not right. really taking it off except to eat and drink. So being mindful of that. Then you think about location, right? You think of, are you a beach person? Are you a city person? Are you a hiking person? Like, like, what do you enjoy? What are you looking to get out of the trip? A mix of the three, maybe two, just one. Being mindful of that and the cities you want to go to. Do you want a city that you can walk around? Do you want a city that you need Uber? Like in Florence, Ubers are illegal. So you have to take a white taxi. That's so yeah, it's again, it's being kind of mindful of this um, and being comfortable with it. Because to your point, if your friends who didn't like, right. you know, if they're cheap or they feel uncomfortable, they're not going to want to get in a white taxi, right? They're right. just not going to exactly. do it. So yeah. <laughs> it's being mindful of the type of traveler. There's a lot of different types of travelers, the adventurous one, the nervous one, the chief yeah. one, there's so many different kinds, but it's identifying that person's needs and understanding 
why they want to go there, how long they want to go for, are they going to other cities? Like, is this a multi-city trip where you're going to be traveling via train around? Because I've done that quite a bit and that's a great way to see Europe. Um, but if you're going to Southeast Asia, are you comfortable getting on mini flights? Which by the way, mini flights in Asia are wonderful and airports there too. Yeah. Like even I did a 50 minute flight from Bangkok to Cambodia. It was like 55 minutes. They gave you a full meal, literally a so full cool. meal. You yeah. don't get that in America. You, for no. an hour and a half flight, I think I get maybe chips, cookies. Yeah, you, you can pretzels. fly from New York to Los Angeles and get like maybe a bag of pretzels. <laughs> but that same trip, that same five hour trip going to Lisbon, you get two meals. <laughs> right? Crazy. Like think that. of how like the perspective of that. It's the <laughs> right. same kind of five, six <laughs> hours but you're getting more food and more value for that flight. <laughs> yes. And and Lisbon's probably cheaper than LA to a certain level. Yeah, oh yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> you know, so it's just, yeah. it's crazy to think about that, right? And that perspective. Yeah. So that always kind of interests me. But again, yeah. it's it's kind of working with someone who's never traveled internationally and really understanding their wants, their needs, desires, and really to me, listening to them. Again, of course, the passport and visa is very, very important. Yeah. But then from there, it's, it's, kind of getting a questionnaire and asking them a lot of questions, getting into budget. You know, a lot of times people book massive trips, whether it's for a wedding, maybe a 40th birthday. So they want to invite their friends. How can they do that? You know, even for bachelor bachelorettes, when you fly, maybe you want to go somewhere international. It's making sure everybody has the right paperwork, right documentation. Everybody's on board with splitting costs, which you hear nightmares of this. I've heard some friends don't pay. You lose yeah. friends over it. It's horrible. That's why I really didn't do that for, I got married recently and I just did like a day bachelorette, a couple of friends set it up. It was great. Nobody fought everyone's friends. So that's perfect. Like, but when you get yeah. into that, that gets messy. So again, it's, 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 it's leveling out expectations on the forefront and getting real about what you can and can't do and what you like and what you don't like to then create this incredible experience. Because once you get the travel bug, it doesn't really go away. Right. It's always in you. Like I will have the travel bug for the rest of my life. Like yeah. my first international trip was going to Israel. Well, technically Canada, but I don't count that. Right. Um, it's attached and they're like, attached. You know, they're yeah, our closest I, ally. <laughs> yeah. And it was nice. It did like a cruise a long time ago, yeah. which was, yeah, really long time ago. Yeah. But my first international trip was to Israel. Right. And I remember like getting off the plane and thinking, this is so cool. I'm in a new country. The world is such a big place. And there's so many different types of people that for the past decade, I've just traveled as much as I could, wherever I could with whoever wanted to travel with me. And I just did it. Yeah. I just, I loved it. And I didn't care. I don't listen. I'm not here to say I make a ton of money, but you can be realistic on how you travel and how much you want to spend. Like in Southeast Asia, hotels could be like $40, $50 a night for like a right. beautiful hotel room. Right. Right. And it includes breakfast. And some, what I did one in Cambodia, I think it was 15 or $30 a night. And my dad and I each got a free massage and free breakfast every day. And wow. he walked in and they had the warm towels that you can like, wa like oh. warm your hands. I was like, this is fantastic. Isn't that great? So it's amazing. So that's why people yeah. go to Southeast Asia. It typically is cheaper um, to go. But again, it's, it's understanding budget expectations, what you're looking for, what you're comfortable with, and really getting to know the person to understand like what they want. So they come back to you and they're like, oh, like we know each other, right? We've built a relationship and I'm able to help you just as much as you want to come back to me. Like it's, you know, you're, you're forming that and you're building trust in that person to trust you. And that's really, really important. Yeah, I think um, I think that's a really good point because people, you know, not just building the relationship with the places that you're that you're going, so you can go back there over and over again, but building the relationship with the travel agent, you know, building the, the relationship with the concierge, building the relationship with you know with all the people that you're going to be working with on your trip, or you know, um, not just working with, but visiting with, and all all the different steps along the way. Um, you know, even if they're not going to be there the next time you go, if you've built that relationship, they can refer you to whoever is going to be there the next time that you go, because that is key. You can always work in a discount. You can always work in, you know, if, or they'll, they'll look out for you. Even if a discount's not available, they'll say, Hey, I'm not going to be here next time, but let me tell you, talk to so-and-so at the, you know, restaurant that you love, talk to so-and-so at the, you know, the cab company that we worked with, talk to so-and-so at the theater that you wanted to go to. All those things, you know, they help for the next time. These trips don't have to be super expensive. You can do a great trip on a budget. You can do a 
you know, a very expensive trip and make it even better than you would even think you could do. So absolutely. I, I love and all it, that. It really, again, it varies on how comfortable you feel, you know, yeah. travel agents, they typically charge a service fee. So it's being mindful of that. You know, for yeah. me, the way I'm looking to help people is I would charge a fee up front. But then right. I'm, my goal is to get them the best deal that I can. And again, because I'm building the relationships with tour guides that I speak to and I work with and I talk to, it's, it's building that, you know, foundation to connect them and to maybe have them offer a discount if they choose, but right. to really take care of them, right? To go above, a little bit more above and beyond than you typically would for anybody else, because I'm referring you now. Right. So it, a lot of it, travel, you know, I've worked at a travel agency for a couple of years. It is all about the relationships, no matter how you slice and dice it, you know, being a travel agent, you have the relationship with the client and you have the relationship with the vendor. So your vendors are a variety of tour companies, hotels, airlines that are able to help you, right? And guide you in that direction. But you also know your clients, right? You know what they like, you know what they want, you know their desires and their wish list and what you're able to do for them. But I think even if you can't afford a tour guide or maybe you're unsure about a tour guide, I'm sorry, a travel agent, and you want to do it yourself, there's plenty of resources out there for you. There are plenty of ways that you can look into it and understand how to book a trip. You know, one of the things I'm looking to also come out with is an online course of how to book a perfect three-day itinerary. And so the goal of that is to help somebody really plan out an itinerary that gives you the, the structure of a tour, right? To book tours and to do tours of a city, but to also be spontaneous, right? And to also have the idea that, you want to have a mix of the two. You don't want to overbook yourself with tours because you're going to be like so miserable. You're going to think, I didn't, I saw the city, but I didn't really have time to wander. Didn't enjoy this, it. Exactly. Yeah. But the flip side of that is if you're too spontaneous, you're going to think, well, what did I miss out on? I didn't have someone tell me. <laughs> <Yeah>. So <laughs> it's kind you're both of like, extremes. <laughs> you have both yeah. extremes. And the thing I'm looking to come with as a course is how can I bring those two extremes together and how to have a balance of both? based on what you feel comfortable with, what you like, what you don't like, and how to really synergize that. So, Because I've done trips where I've synergized three full days, and I felt really confident that I saw enough, but I didn't overwhelm myself. And I was able to walk around and gallivant and explore, but I still got to have the tour guides talk like my perfect example of this is Rome. Here's my perfect three-day itinerary in Rome okay. to give you an idea. I don't count the days that you land and leave. Why? Because it's not a full day. Right. So when you get there, we landed on a Wednesday afternoon. So I remember we, I always love to shower after I get off a plane. I just mm -hmm. feel really icky. Yeah. I don't know. I just, it doesn't matter what time of day it is. I like to get in a shower. It just, yep. I feel like, <sighs> I like to do my makeup. I like to do my hair. I don't care how long it takes. Typically it doesn't take me that long, but I like to like feel confident and comfortable and start to get in that time zone as soon as I'm there because it will help you kind of get over that. I find going from America to Europe is worse than going from America to Asia, which is interesting, but okay. it, time wise, it just feels better. And so landed in Rome, my girlfriend and I kind of walked around, we took some pictures, we went to a restaurant that a friend of mine recommended and just kind of like again, spontaneous. I don't, again, I will include that as part of the full three full days, mm -hmm. but I don't consider landing a full day. That's like a half day that I tell people to like, just like get your feet wet, right? Yeah. Get your feet wet, kind of like feel around. First full day I was in Rome, all tours. In the morning I did the Vatican, which I highly, highly recommend doing a tour um, with. I would say even like a bigger group tour because there's so much and there's so many people. You just kind of want to get in and get out. Oh yeah, yeah very overwhelming. And it's huge. You kind of want someone to tell you what to look at, what to see, and then you want to get out, yeah. which was great. Took about three hours. Then we just found a local place and ate because I didn't really understand the train systems of Rome. We just, in Rome, you can get an Uber. So we Ubered to go to our next location, which was at the Coliseum. And so to do a private tour in the Coliseum is great. I believe I did the Roman guy as a tour and they take you, like they walk you toward the Coliseum. Like you see a different one part of it, which I forgot the name of it now. And then you walk toward the Coliseum. And what I love about doing a tour, which if you, you can go there by yourself, but the tour, you actually get to go on the main floor, you know, like where the gladiators perform. Yeah. You get to actually walk on that, but you can only walk on that with a tour guide. Okay. So I definitely recommend doing that and having that ability. Cause then you can take pictures for a little bit and they tell you the history and you can walk around and it was great. So that was a full day of tours. And then at night we did dinner, walked around, and then that was it. 
that Friday morning, I did the Vespa tour that I mentioned earlier. Oh yeah. So that was about a four hour experience where you go around everywhere, literally went to like the Trevi Fountain. We got to see the views of uh, Rome from every different angle. It was just wonderful. And he even got to be flexible. So I'm Jewish and I wanted to see the Jewish quarters of Rome. It's very small, but we kind of got to go there and walk around for a little bit. And then we left and did other things. And he likes to end the tour with this. It's like a weird bomb thing that they do. So they have like a cannon and at 12, there's a whole crowd of people and it goes off. It's so loud, but I would have never known that without a tour guide. Right. So we did that, which was toward the end, took some more pictures and it was great. And then we had the rest of the day, right. Where he was like, where can I drop you off? So, or we said, where do you recommend, right? Where do you recommend dropping us off? So recommended a different area of Rome to check out. And we just walked around. And then we had the last day of spontaneous, right? Okay. The last day where you're able to like walk around, you get to like go back to different areas that you wanted to see or check out new areas that you didn't because a tour guide recommended it or whatever it is. And then at the end, you kind of like at night, you kind of pack, you get your things ready. Cause then the next day, chances are you're going to your next destination or you're going home, whatever, you know, your itinerary calls for. But that kind of three day trip, is the premise of what I'm looking to do in terms of my online course. But a lot of it really goes down to that pre-planning. And that's where I get into the nuts and bolts of it all to understand the type of traveler you are, if you like mornings or nights, what you enjoy. And again, it's, it's breaking down all those barriers of questions to not make it overwhelming, but to make it really simple. And so to me, that just, that just to give you an example of a three day itinerary, that just Uh feels right of like seeing all the big sites but then also leaving you time to walk around and shop or eat or whatever you want to do. I love that because it, you know, when people think of the, of their trip, they try to cram a bunch of stuff into the day that they land, or they try to cram a bunch of stuff into like right before their plane takes off. And that to me, it's not only does it add to your jet lag, you know, it also makes you feel like, um, how am I going to get all this stuff done? And it, it's stressful. And so why, why do that? I love that you're building in the, the time for spontaneity. You know, that's, uh, to me, it's just, I don't know. It just, it, that, uh, and the whole getting off the plane and taking a shower, not only does it revitalize you, <laughs> but it, it also, does. it gives your, it gives your mind and your body a chance to kind of acclimate to the time zone because you, you know, it, your body can say, okay, I'm refreshed. I'm going to go walk around the city. I'm going to go get used to whatever the atmosphere is here, climate wise, or, you know, um, you know, get, literally find your sea legs. Yes. You, know, you, can, you can walk out there and go, okay, this is what the ground and the air and everything feels like in this new area. Um, I, it's very smart to include that, you know, as part of your, part of your, uh, you know, acclimation. So I think that's great. Thank you. We are coming up on the end of the show. So tell everyone where they can find you. Um, obviously, your your podcast is available on um, kind of anywhere that people can find podcasts. But um, your website, your blog, tell us all about where, where, we, where we can find you and when. Sure. So my website is www.travelexperiencesreimagined.com. I link essentially everything in there every week. I out a blog post. I send an email newsletter on a Friday. So my episodes come out every Friday. And if you subscribe to my newsletter, you'll know which episode comes out and when it will be released. And I will also include additional information of anything upcoming or anything new. My put my um, distribution for my podcast through Buzzsprout. And so I'm on all the major platforms though. I'm on Apple, I'm on Spotify, Stitcher, Google, and various other smaller ones. So you can find me anywhere. Very cool. Well, I'm a big fan of Stitcher because you don't have to have a subscription to to uh, listen to anything on there. So I love that one. And Audible is a great one too. Uh, the other one, sometimes you have to actually subscribe or pay per episode. I'm not a fan of paying for anything. <laughs> as far as as far <laughs> I don't as blame content, you. I know as far as content goes, we pay for enough stuff in our lives. Save the money for your traveling. <laughs> but, yes. Uh, yes. There you go. Exactly. There you go. Yeah, I like that. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, well, I really appreciate you being on. This is the last episode of the year for me. So uh, it's a great thing to end with. You know, people can start talking about traveling in the new year. So this is awesome. Yes. Marielle, uh, Marielle Fry, the host of Travel Experiences Reimagined. Uh, the podcast is available on all major platforms. And um, we really appreciate you being on. And um, I hope you have a wonderful end of your year and a wonderful end of your holiday season. Happy New Year. Happy 2022. I cannot believe we're already in 2022. I, know. <laughs> I, I feel know. like it's just, it's all flying by, but it's also like 
it's flying by at a snail's pace my grandma used to say it's, it's like yeah, i know it's very yeah. surreal i'm it but is. i can't thank you enough for having me on i'm honored to be here it's been wonderful to talk to you mike oh, thank you my so pleasure. much i feel like yeah i feel like we've known each other forever at this point so. <laughs> i know <laughs> i will um i'll put your link to your uh, your main your main site um on on this episode so people can find all your all of your other uh links through that so uh, thank you so much for being on and um I appreciate you uh, so much. So uh, uh, bear with me and I will talk to you on the other side of the theme music. Maybe if it plays. Technical difficulties. <laughs> I'm blaming right. the cable company again. That's okay. There we go. <laughs>